So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Berkman Center's Tuesday Speaker Series. Really excited to see um, such a terrific crowded room of folks that are really interested in um, education and the future of education online. Uh, my name is Amr Asher. I'm on staff at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Before we begin, I just had a couple of housekeeping things. I will then introduce Anya and let her take it from there. Um, just please note that these talks are being webcast and recorded for posterity. So uh, during the Q&A, the Q&A will be recorded. So um, if you're not comfortable with that, uh, you can always talk to Anya afterwards. Um, and then this video will be posted to the Berkman Center's uh, website. We also have the speaker series that runs throughout the summer on Tuesdays. And if you're not already on the weekly events email list, you can go to our website and sign up to receive uh, weekly announcements about um, upcoming talks as well as videos that we've posted in the past weeks uh, of previous talks. Um, so we're so happy to welcome Anya Kamenetz to talk to us about who can learn online and how. Anya is a writer at Fast Company Magazine, and she's the author of two books, DIYU and Generation Debt, and two ebooks focused on the future of open education and education. Um, the Ed Punks Guide, which was funded by the Gates Foundation, as well as Learning, Freedom, and the Web, which was produced in collaboration with the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, so we're so glad to welcome Anya, and we'll have a Q&A after she does her talk. And welcome. All right. Thank you so, so much for this opportunity, and, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to serve free food at all of my talks from now on. This is really <laughs> super excellent. So um, I'm really pleased and honored um, to have this community uh, kind of help me think through some questions uh, that have been on my mind lately as I've been, you know, I've been talking about and writing about the future of education for a while, and uh, a lot of stuff is kind of hitting the big time now, and so there's a whole new set of questions, I feel like, that are, that are just kind of getting out there, and, and, and new eyes are on the problem. So this is a really great opportunity, I think, to try to, um, to shape the future and shape solutions. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit about where I'm coming from, right? Um, I'm a, I am the daughter of two college professors, um, so that, I think, shapes my uh, feeling about the, the academy, the university. Um, I am a journalist, so I'm not a social scientist. Everything I have to say is strictly anecdotal and based on asking questions um, to other people that are experts. And uh, I've been in my career, my first book was about, was about student loans, so uh, very much biased toward looking at education, first of all, from an economic perspective, but also, I think subtly, I didn't realize this at first, but it's very different uh, to look at education from the point of view of what students want and what they, what they need as opposed to what institutions have to offer or what professors have to offer. Um, and so I'm kind of going to be pursuing that uh, through this talk, like what do students need, what do they want. Um, and then I'm, in, I'm a mother, so that means I'm, I'm really interested in education right now from a very hands-on perspective of how we learn in the world and looking at learning as a natural process, an opening process, uh, not something that necessarily needs to always be planned out in advance, um, but something that we all do all the time as long as we're awake. So um, why, do, why does education need to change? Why, why are we talking about radical innovation in higher education? Or maybe we're not. Maybe you're not interested in radical innovation, but stuff is happening. It's coming. So uh, the three major impetus that I see for radical change in higher education are the movement of higher education online, the integration of higher education with greater use of technology, is cost, access, and relevance. Um, so Cost, obviously, uh, this is a really big issue right now. It's been on the table in a new way. Um, people are marching. They're marching in Montreal. They're marching in Chile. They're marching in, um, you know, Occupy Wall Street. This is a picture of the, right, the, the march route that the Montreal student <laughs> protesters sent to the police. They asked for, you know, their route in advance. This is what they sent to police with the help of Google Maps. People are mad. Kids are mad. Students are mad uh, about the cost of college. Why are they mad? Uh, because it's going up a lot. Um, it's gone up twice the rate of inflation uh, for my whole lifetime. Um, so since 1970s, twice the rate of inflation every single year. More than anything else uh, in the economy, essentially, even more than medical care. Um, and this obviously leads to this really huge problem of student loan debt, which is something that um, I could talk about for hours and hours and hours, but it's, you know, it's a growing problem. It, uh, has sort of succeeded the mortgage crisis as a major debt problem that people are curious about and interested in, and I'm happy to field any questions that people have. But let's just take for, you know, establish for a second that it's a problem, right? Um, however, you know, the question of access is a little bit different from the question of cost. 
because uh, a lot of people can't access higher education, even if they could pay for it, because there aren't enough classrooms in the countries where they live, right? So we have an issue here in the United States where we have about 37% of people get some kind of post-secondary uh, credential. We'd like it to be more like 60%, so that's a pretty uh, large leap. Um, but then you have entire regions of, of, of world, uh, in the world that want to go from 5% to 35% with a post-secondary degree. So there's very, very large numbers of people that want um, a degree. And you know, a really uh, kind of insane illustration of this was uh, last in January in uh, Johannesburg, there was a stampede at the gate to get into entrance exams at the university in which someone's mother was actually pushed down and killed. Um, because this is the, you know, in, in regions and areas where they haven't built a higher education system, all of a sudden they need to get from 5% to 35%. It takes a lot to build. And there really isn't um, any, you know, the UNESCO kind of thinks this is going to double over this decade, the demand, um, and we don't really have the physical resources to build the seats, let alone, never mind if we somehow could find the funding to do it. Um, so that's access. And then there's this crazy question of, is it even relevant? Are we, are we teaching people in the right ways? Are people learning um, the kinds of things they need to know in the ways that they need to know them in order to uh, be part of the 21st century? So this is a whole other set of questions. And you, know, you look at books like Academically Adrift, or there's books uh, you know, sort of interrogating and, and criticizing the, the academic system. And you know, it's really strange, because you've got a whole continent's worth of people trying to get into the classrooms. And then other people are kind of who are in those classrooms are saying, this is no good. This is useless, what we're learning here. It's, it's not changing fast enough, and it's rote learning, and it's industrial age learning for a post-industrial era. And so there's all these, you know, um, very strange uh, problems there. You know, I probably the, 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 people, the people in Johannesburg would say, give me that industrial age learning, I want more of that, you know, I can't get enough of it. But then people here are saying, no, we can't, we don't have it. So, um, so my kind of um, way of looking at this, and I, I started to try to answer the question of why is higher education, um, why is the cost growing so much? Uh, and, you know, and the, the very basic way of answering that question, the very common way of answering that question, is with reference to this thing called Baumol's cost disease. So um, is anyone familiar with the cost disease um, string quartet? So uh, this, this paper in 1966, William um, Baumol and William Bowen, one of the, Bowen later became the president of Princeton, um, two economists, and they wrote this paper called Performing Arts, the Economic Dilemma. So if you look at this, you know, if you look back at the CPI graph, uh, from you know 1978, but this goes even beyond you know back to the 1960s, that uh, the cost of lots of things has been flat or even declining because of industrialization, because of mass production, because of uh, automation, because of globalization. Clothing is cheaper, cars are cheaper, food is cheaper. Um, but then there's other things where the cost continues to grow up. And they said, you know, why is the cost of a string quartet keep going up? Well, you can't. Uh, you can't uh, cut any of the members of a string quartet, right, uh, and, and have the same music. You can't perform the music any faster. There's no way of speeding up the production line. Um, and you can't actually export the string quartet to China if you want to have a live concert. So uh, this is highly skilled, labor-intensive type of work. It's not easily, you know, translatable to automation. And they later extended this uh, metaphor to, uh, to healthcare and obviously, of course, to education. If you have a large number of people, it's very labor intensive and those le labor is very skilled. It takes time to teach those people to do it. Um, and then it be kind of becomes a little bit circular because it's like the reason education costs so much is that the people who are doing education need a lot of years of education, which costs a lot. So therefore, the cost keeps going up because it keeps going up. Um, and this is really a problem. You know, if you think that we keep needing more education and everybody needs more education at, you know, as our society progresses, and yet the cost of it keeps running away um, past inflation. You know, I used to have a graph in my, um, in my presentations where I looked at that, you know, that tuition line, and it's very similar to something that you see in sort of an ecological presentation where you say like, you know, population, when, when, when something starts going in a curve like this, you start to see a crash. Like that's what happens at the end of a curve like that generally. Um, it doesn't just go up forever because most things can't go up forever. Um, so I started to think about, well, maybe there is, and lots of people are thinking about this, maybe there's some way to somehow escape this dynamic. You know, we don't want to have a crash and have an extinction of universities, but we want to have, to escape the dynamic of, of Baumol's cost disease. And, you know, we started to think, and people started to think and talk about maybe the way to do that is um, to kind of go into a realm where the rules are really different. 
right? So people are here have heard of Moore's Law, somewhat, maybe somewhat familiar. Moore's Law is this, uh, this observation made by Gordon Moore at Intel in 1974, 73, where he said, uh, you know, these, these chips, they're getting faster and they're getting cheaper. And so the number of transistors is gonna, develop, uh, is gonna double every 18 months or every 24 months, and the chips are gonna get faster and faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that has held true by this, for this entire time, right? Um, Moore's law actually, interestingly, very interestingly, is might be coming to the end because silicone, we've gotten to, we're getting to like an atomic level and the only way we're gonna be able to, to continue doing this is either with cloud computing or nano computing or quantum computing, but that's like a whole, that's a really, really interesting question. But nevertheless, it's held true for a really long time. Technology, it keeps getting better, it keeps getting faster, and it keeps getting cheaper at the same time. And the cheaper part is very interesting to me because I think that a university like this one, uh, never thinks about getting cheaper. It never gets cheaper. Because no one thinks about getting cheaper. No one wants to get cheaper. No one wants to even think about how things are paid for. It's anathema. It's completely outside the realm of the conversation. So when people start talking about improving education, um, they start talking about using technology to improve education, but they leave the cost completely out of it. And the point that I'd like to make here is that the reason that technology improves is because cost saving is a key constraint that is put into the system when you try to innovate. And stuff does not get better unless it also gets cheaper at the same time. Um, so that's why a lot of people feel like the future of education and the way to escape this unsustainable dynamic is through open education, open technology, um, open resources. So uh, what does that mean? Well, for my convenience, uh, I like to think about education, and this is completely from the point of view of the student. We're not talking about research, we're not talking about maybe the role of you know, faculty and their, their kind of lives or their uh, labor conditions. We're talking about what does a student want out of education? Generally speaking, three things, or three kinds of things. They want content, they want skills and knowledge, um, specific knowledge. They want socialization, which is a very complex process of you know, relationships with other people, with mentors, with peers, and a sort of self-development um, that we, we all kind of hope to get out of a classical education experience. And then finally, they want something to prove, something to show that they uh, did this and that they can get a job and that they, are, you know, they have an imprimatur from an institution that has um, shown them to be excellent in one way or another. Um, so how does the idea of openness affect these things? How can it potentially improve these things and also lower the cost of these things? Um, is the question. Um, so uh, this, this kind of question and this kind of innovation first hit the world in the realm of content. Um, content being sort of the most easily exportable and understandable uh, resources uh, that uh, education produces. So, uh, you know, we have NIP, MIT's Open Courseware started in 2001. Um, students, you know, the university putting its lectures online, its uh, people putting textbooks online, Creative Commons license. Actually, one interesting footnote, the first open content license was actually created for the use of educational materials by David Wiley, and he was one of the first people who had initial input in, into Creative Commons, and, and education becomes a very important um, part of what Creative Commons does from, now, you know, from then on. Um, and so, you know, Khan Academy is something that is not technically open. People have heard about Khan Academy? So it's not technically open in, 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 in the sense of open source, but it is free and it is also freely reusable. Anybody can kind of take it. And there's a lot of cool uh, things that happen when you start to have open and free resources that are no longer subject to scarcity, like the scarcity of having to be in a classroom with someone, or even the scarcity of having to purchase a copy of a book. Obviously, they're infinitely reproducible and shareable. Um, they can be taken and um, modified for people's uh, you know, specific needs. They are constantly, when they're not so much because they're open, but because they're digital, they're constantly updatable um, in a way that, that a paper textbook is not. And so there's lots of great uh, things about open content. Um, the not so think great things about open content, because we're trying to be even handed here, um, is that it's just content, right? So it's just a resource for consumption, and it can be very passive. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily an improvement to replace a lousy teacher with a video, even if it's a great video, because it's just something you watch. And then if you have a question, you don't necessarily have a way to get it answered. Um, and it also can be very isolating, you know, right? So you turn on the faucet of um, the content, and just like anything else that you consume, um, you're just sitting there kind of shoveling it in. And that's very counter to 
uh, you know, a classical paradigm of, of Socratic education where you're kind of having an interchange with someone. So these are the, the problems that people have with open content, but it's also wonderful, it's great, because you know, people spend $1,000 a year on textbooks. If you're a community college student, you spend as much on textbooks as you do on your tuition. So this is very important to have this stuff and to get it more adopted, but it just is not the whole answer. Um, can we have open socialization? This is really con controversial, right? Um, what kind of relationships do people have online? Uh, can you really have a mentorship or a close study group relationship online? Um, but this is something we haven't worked out yet because you know we're, we're just catching up to how we relate to each other online and how we interact in social networks and what our persona is like in social networks. But people are trying, right? And I think one of the interesting things about you know how the online world and social media makes us aw very aware of our horizontal connections to each other, which is a very interesting counterpoint to the traditional set of relationships that is foregrounded in an educational setting, which is a relationship between like the person at the front of the room talking and everyone else sitting and listening. Um, it's always been true that in learning, it's very important to learn from people around you and horizontally connected to you, your peers, to learn through conversation and to learn through collaboration and even competition. Um, that's always been true and it's always been cultivated in the best settings. Um, but online learning really makes that visible right away because first of all, when you have volunteer networks, networks of people trying to absorb information together, um, they tend to cooperate and people have lots of ways of collaborating and cooperating. Uh, you know, social networks make that easy. They're called networks, so we know that it's a network. It's not a social, uh, you know, it's not a social amphitheater, it's a social network. So you're talking to the people next to you and the people who have other questions. So this is a very interesting paradigm of learning. Peer-to-peer um, -peer university is one place where people can sort of find each other, form study groups. And foregrounding the peer aspect of learning, I'm gonna go back to the cost thing for a second, is really important because it's what allows it to scale. So if you have people, peers that can help you answer questions or help you study or help you get over a hump, um, that is very, very important. And I think some of the platforms that we're gonna be talking about in a second are actually using peer evaluations and, and relying on that as a way to kind of try to scale the network. So that's very interesting as well. Um, so, and then you have this very large, very strange question of what would an open credit accreditation look like, right? Um, and I wrote this, this ebook, The Edupunks Guide, to talk about sort of DIY accreditation, open accreditation. You know, it's worth noting that if you look at our system of accreditation that we have right now, it seems very monolithic um, because there's this thing called the bachelor's degree and everybody understands what it means more or less and it seems to be like the gold standard for post-secondary education, but if you look at it from another point of view, it, that's not how it works at all. Because in fact, um, by some standards, 73% of the post-secondary learning that occurs um, outside of high school, past high school, happens outside of accredited colleges and universities. What does that mean? It means continuing education credits, it means licenses, state licenses and exams, um, nonprofit associations, professional associations that, that credit people, it means Microsoft and Cisco certification. So there's a lot of learning and there's a lot of post-secondary learning that prepares people for careers and even enriches their lives that has nothing to do with the bachelor's degree. So if we start to accept and understand that the accreditation system is a lot more multifarious than we think it is, the people that have you know, the gold standard degree, the bachelor's degree, then we can kind of understand what an open accreditation system might look like where there's more recognition of things like badges, things like portfolios, modular learning, um, learning that is tied to specific skills, and importantly, I think for, you know, go back to the relevance question, uh, learning that is constantly updated because your bachelor's degree gets less and less relevant as the years go by. Um, that's why people have to go back and get a law degree or get a, you know, a master's degree. And uh, still it's not enough. Your skills have to be constantly updated. And so in a world where the, the burden is upon educated people to continue to educate themselves, it seems more and more important to have uh, different kinds of certifying different kinds of learning. Um, so now we've got some solutions to this. There are people who are trying to put together, um, in the last few months, this has emerged, it's gotten a lot of press, right? People trying to put together open content, open socialization, and open accreditation. Um, and so there's Udacity that came out of the AI course that was taught at Stanford, Sebastian Thrun, and he wants to teach, you know, free online university classes for everyone, right? And uh, you've got Coursera, very similar, education for everyone, right? And they've got very similar set of tools, actually, all of these, and, and then there's this one here, right, um, at X. So very similar set of tools, uh, videos, short videos, five minutes, and then they stop and ask a question. You have to answer the question, you get feedback right away. Then there are, um, there's exercises to do, more elaborate kind of problem sets to work through, 
uh, a lot of these are very technical courses. Um, and then uh, you get uh, feedback right away. You get, again, you get scores. You know, you know what you did. Um, in the MIT uh, original, the MIT X course in, uh, in robotics, it was really cool because you could export an image of your homework scores, which was like a little bar graph. And people were taking those and putting them on their Facebook profiles and saying, yo, look what I got in robotics, um, which is kind of an amazing, I think, thing in terms of you know, what certification might mean. Then there were social tools as well. All of these have social tools. They have wikis. They have forums. Um, in Coursera, in the first round of, of the open courses, that was the machine learning course uh, from Andrew Ning. Uh, in the first round of that course, uh, a student would post on the forum, he'd get a response in an average of 22 minutes from another student. There's a very active conversation live going on because they also have a really large scale. All of these, um, these projects uh, got over 100,000 people registered. Registered. It's important to remember, there's a really big power law distribution. People register, 104,000 people in the first machine learning course. 46,000 people did one assignment. 23,000 people, 25,000 people did most of the assignments. Um, but that's cool, you know, it's free, right? It's pretty impressive still, but it's important to think about that when you think about what does learning for everyone mean, right? So this is my question. People are getting really excited about this stuff, which is good. It's, it's content created by the best professors at the best universities, and it is able to be used by anyone anywhere. Able to be used by, right? Open to be used by anyone anywhere because it's free. They think that they might be able to, um, they're certifying people's learning, they're certifying the completion of the course, and I've talked to people, people are using that certification, they're taking it, they're putting it in their resumes, they're using it to help them decide what they should study when they do go to college, they're using it to start businesses, they're using it to um, hire other people to figure out, you know, what type of people should I be hiring, because, you know, what do they need to know. So this stuff is already happening, it's proving itself. And so this, to me, is the point where people are getting really excited, they're hearing about this for the first time, or they're hearing more about it, and they're starting to take it seriously. Universities, you know, great universities across the land are having conversations in their provost office saying, what is our open education strategy? What do we need to be doing? This is a very important moment. To ask, what does it mean to have education be for everyone? Right? Um, Who's already good at this stuff? The people that I talk to who have taken these courses and done really well in them have some things in common. They're really super, super smart. It doesn't matter if they are a 16-year-old Greek high school student who taught himself programming when he was 13, or a 13-year-old eighth grader in Northern Virginia who wants to you know, uh, just study in her spare time because her public school is spending all their time doing testing, drilling testing, and she wants to like, learn something herself, or if you are an entrepreneur in Bangalore, or you know, these are all people that I've talked to, super wicked smart, all of them. Um, obviously, they are very self-motivated. They are the creme de la creme. And it's very interesting. This is how open education works. You can let everybody in in the beginning, and then people start self-selecting, right? And it's, very, it's the opposite to how education has always worked. Because you know, a place like Harvard, what is your acceptance rate? Like 5.9% undergraduate. Um, you, you, like, you did all the work in the, in the front end, in the admissions office, let, you know, figuring out who was smart. And then it doesn't matter what happens, essentially, to them for the rest of the four years. This is a much more <laughs> meritocratic way. It's, I mean, you know, if you talk about the signaling effect, the signaling effect is you got in. Everybody knows that. You, it's, it's, you, might as well just be, you might as well just leave after the first semester. But uh, like some billionaires did, right? Um, so... <laughs> so I think that it's a, not necessarily a bad thing that people leave, but it's also important to think about to succeed in this way, you need to be very self-motivated. And then there's obviously social things. Even if you're from a very far away place and it's accessible to you, you still are a person with leisure time, you're still a person with, uh, with access to uh, technology, right? Um, is this a problem? Why is this a problem? Well. This is Anuj uh, Kumar from Bangalore, who is one of these people, right? He and his pal, like, they, they left their jobs at Oracle, they took the machine learning class at Stanford, um, then they started a company that does, like, big data machine learning stuff. And his wife, by the way, is a doctor, also took, like, the, the medical school courses from Coursera. So this is, they're doing really well. This is, the, the, the platforms that we're building right now are tools to make excellent people even better. Which is great, because we need more excellent people in the world, and that is a very important, uh, task of education, right? We want to offer excellent people the chance in the platform to excel. And there's not enough classrooms, no matter how many you build here, there's not going to be enough for all the excellent people to come and learn. So you definitely want to have that. But 
you know, there's a whole other aspect and facet to education. And for me, as someone who looks at the economics of education and looks at um, the social force of education, you know, there's a meritocratic aspect to education and there's a democratizing aspect to education. We want it to be available to everyone, everyone. Not just the excellent everyone's, but the everyone's, everyone's. And who, right now, is not so well served by the system that we have right now? Um, well, people who have different kinds of learning abilities, right? People who didn't do well in school. They don't love learning. They don't salivate at the prospect of taking a free Stanford or MIT course in uh, robotics. Um, people who have jobs or families or people who are older independent students are not doing so well. Um, a lot of times if they are, you know, they, there's sort of six different classifications of people that are non-traditional students. The non-traditional student is the new traditional student, right? Someone who's over 24, someone who has a dependent, someone who has a job, um, and uh, I think someone who's the first in their family to go to college, perhaps someone who's the child of immigrants. If you have three out of those six, you have like a eight, nine, ten percent chance of graduating once you start um, a community college. So there's a lot of people who aren't succeeding, and they have very obvious, uh, very obvious qualities. Uh, obviously, people who have little money or not a lot of experience with with computers. Um, and people who have other things going on in their lives that might affect their ability to be so intensely self-motivated. This is really a huge opportunity that we might be missing, right? Because these are the people that maybe we want to help, and these are the people who maybe can't help themselves, and these are the people that already go to the institutions that have the least resources. Right? At community colleges right now are educating half of all undergraduates with $10,000 to spend per head, which is a third of the resources of an average public university. Um, and, you know, the question, I think a really important question is, how can open content, open socialization, open accreditation be leveraged to help those people and to achieve this really important other task uh, that we have for education, which is to create, you know, a more just and, you know, civil, fair, democratic society. Um, here's some ideas. And I hope in the Q&A that we talk about more ideas. Um, can we reappropriate existing infrastructure? What does that mean? So let's say that we have a full complement, and then it's like 18 months from now. This is not far away. 18 months from now, Coursera and edX and Udacity and a couple other ones that haven't gotten started yet have created a full curriculum of college courses that are free, that are excellent, that are, um, by the way, I didn't even get into the fact that they have adaptive learning platforms, so they're constantly they're taking in data on how all the learners are learning and they're constantly um, improving uh, the way that they, they teach the material to different kinds of people, which is great. Um, so let's say that this resource exists. Um, how could you then structure a university or how could you then structure a learning experience for people who uh, don't fit the Anuj model um, that it would be helpful for them as well? Uh, I think that one thing that you could do, there's this very obscure program out of Portland um, State University called Learner Web, um, where they basically created a really simple set of learning tools. Um, and, the, and they're online, and you can pick a learning plan. Like my learning plan is I want to be, you know, get a GED. My learning plan is I want to pass an English you know, ESL test. My learning plan is I want to uh, become a citizen. And then you are on the computer and you're choosing these things and it, it offers you like curated portals to different resources. But the, the key part about it is you're doing it in a place. Like you're doing it in the literacy center, you're doing it in the library, and there are people there that can help you. They're not necessarily content or subject matter experts in learning English, but they are people who are trained in social services and in motivating people and helping and listening to them and helping them figure out, you know, um, ways to solve their own problems when they hit a snag. So, you can kind of imagine an idea where the, the learning stuff and the accreditation is all served. People are nodding, okay, right? It's really simple. It's served on the computer, and the people roaming the room um, have the other kind of personal face-to-face -face skills to help make it happen. And this maybe could be a lot cheaper than uh, trying to do everything or trying to have you know, someone who is, I mean, this is not very effective right now. Like if, if you guys, imagine that you guys all have, you know, you're veterans or you have a kid at home or you have all like, problems that you're, you're dealing with on your minds, you, your computer's not working and you couldn't uh, get gas to come to the class today, and I'm up here in the front of the room, I'm not helping you with any of those problems, right? This is a one to many. I'm not here to like help you with that. But if I were talking on your screen and then there's people coming around, maybe helping you with more of that, maybe you can help, you can stay the course a little bit better. Um, 
maybe those people aren't necessarily working for colleges. Maybe they're working in community centers or different kinds of community uh, organizations. Maybe they're working in, at employers. Like maybe these, these learning hubs or learning centers take place within, oh God, like a, a pro-social employer, like somebody who wants to help his, his empl employers become employees, become better. Um, that could happen, right? Like a Starbucks or somebody who wants to get a lot of points for being like a good corporate citizen. Like, uh, creates this learning uh, project or this learning system for their people to do in their off hours um, and helps motivate them. Because the other important thing about that is what I mean by a microfinance model. Um, so in microfinance, uh, the Grameen Bank, they kind of discovered that the way to succeed and allow people to pay back their loans is to create circles where everybody together borrows and they're all kind of responsible to each other. So there's a peer commitment, there's a peer obligation, there's a reciprocal feeling that goes on. And I think, you know, talking again about the, the, the social or the, the, the socialization aspect or the network aspect of education and of learning, you can do a lot of great stuff online, um, but you can also import that peer feeling and that peer aspect into a face-to-face -face community, and it can go back and forth between the online and the offline world. So what I discovered from talking to um, the Coursera and the MITx participants is that a lot of them did it with friends. They did it with family members. They did it, uh, they were working on the course together. They also used the social tools, so there wasn't any difference. There were some people that only did the social tools, so they were just by themselves in a cafe, pounding it out, asking questions um, in the forums when they had questions. But there were other people that were there together with other friends, and that seemed to really be helpful. Their friend didn't have to know anything about machine learning in order to help them learn machine learning. The friend just had to help keep them accountable and make it fun and interesting. So can we create those kinds of communities or leverage existing communities where the learning is kind of piped in from outside, but the relationships are, are real and face-to-face. -face. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, that's kind of the, 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 that's something I'm playing around with, like how could we use these resources for, um, for this purpose? And the, you know, the fourth kind of, this probably should be the first principle, it's designed for basic needs. Machine learning is not gonna help you know, the, kind of, the kind of student that we're talking about. They need something like CS101. There is a great CS101 class on the Coursera platform that was created and developed specifically for introducing people to computer science that never had any computer science. I took it, it was great. I never took computer science before. I learned a lot about computers, how they work. So it's a different, you know, optimizing it for accessibility. This is not something that's naturally going to happen because the, the professors who are on these platforms, right now it's all totally voluntary and they're just teaching the courses that they're most excited to teach. Um, but if you, let's say the federal government or someone else who cares a lot about accessibility got involved in this, you could, you could say, well, what are our most important strategic basic needs courses that we need to build and develop? Um, and, you know, and throw some inspiring stuff in there. Don't just make it be like, you know, broccoli, bread and butter uh, courses, but like make it interesting, but also make it designed specifically for the person that they may not have in mind when they're building these courses. Um, and then, you know, and then institutions can maybe repurpose these and, and something that institutions right now are already doing, which I think is really interesting for accreditation, Empire State College has been a, 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 uh, a pioneer in this for many, many years, since the 1970s, where there was another wave of sort of uh, concern about accessibility. Empire State College concentrates on credit for prior learning. They're part of the SUNY system, public university in New York State. Um, but when everybody comes in, they sort of have an intake session with a counselor um, who has a two-hour conversation with them where they talk about what are your interests, what are your goals, and what have you already learned? And their goal is to try to get people to pre present portfolios and exams and testing and get credit for prior learning. Credit for prior learning is this incredible tool that has been around for 40 years where uh, you do a little bit of self-reflection on your something that was a workplace training or a military training or a volunteer experience or a hobby or just an interest of yours, and you create a narrative around it, you submit documentation, and what they find with people who get credit for prior learning is they are better, at, they're doing metacognition, they're thinking about their own thinking process, and they learn about how they, own, how they learn. They are much more likely to succeed uh, in college, and they get, there, they get there faster, they get there with, uh, you know, they, they have the credits that they take with them from their past, and they're more motivated, and they also are better in a lot of qualitative measures. So it's a really, really cool tool. I think that organizations, if you, know, if you think about a world where people can go and play in the sea of open learning, and then once they've learned a little bit about what they want to learn, what they need to learn, they can plunge in and get, start to get credit for that and then fill in the, the, uh, the gaps. I think that's a really interesting use of our existing infrastructure. Um, this is another kind of organization outfit, the Kale um, 
uh, Council on Adult and Experiential Learning has this portal called Learning Counts, which is supposed to be for everybody to get uh, college credit from their, their existing experiences. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunities here to sum up, right, um, in the evolution of education uh, and all of these needs being served in different ways, um, crucially cheaper. Um, but what's important to realize is that we get kind of complacent about technology. The people that don't like technology are sort of complacent that it's never going to replace the face-to-face, -face, and they're right about that. The people who like technology are kind of complacent about the idea, well, it just keeps getting better and better, and it's amazing, and they're right about that. Um, but the truth kind of lies somewhere in the middle, which is that there's stuff that happens on its own and seems to have this incredible internal momentum, and then there's other stuff that people who care about this really need to pay attention to and try to shape as it you know, starts to be designed and starts to make an impact in wider ways if we're going to have you know, a future of education that is better in every way um, for all of the ways and all the ways that we all care about it so much. Um, and yeah, that's, I'm wrapping up a little close to the Q&A, so thank you. You mentioned um, access to computers as one of the limiting factors. Um, do you think with a, a plethora of these learning resources available, do you think that might provide more momentum for like a one laptop per child kind of initiative again? Like I know that kind of didn't really work out that well, but what do you think about that? I'm doing a story right now on lap one laptop per child, so it's really interesting. Um, you know, it's, it wasn't as much of a face plan as people seem to think it was. There's like two million computers out there in classrooms. Um, and there's another two million Intel classmate PCs, which is kind of a, a copycat project. Uh, but I think, you know, what people feel like is happening now is that the smartphone and the tablet is overtaking the laptop as being, and there's like six billion cell phone um, connections around the world. So, you know, it really is very close to universal. Now, the idea of teaching through SMS is not, very, not the same as teaching through five-minute videos. It's very, very difficult. And University of the People is an example of, a, uh, of an online, non-profit, start, uh, startup, non-accredited, that's trying to do stuff in a way that people in Congo can access it, which means like PDFs. So it's very difficult to be innovative in the pedagogy when you have like a very crappy internet connection. Um, so, you know, I think you kind of need to develop both, and you need to try to think about making it as accessible as possible. But yeah, you know, Yes, the answer is yes. This, there is more momentum if you think about, so what one University of the People did in Haiti was they actually built a computer lab in Haiti so that people could go and, and build, you know, be online. And I think that that's not a bad use of resources. Uh, back in the back. Yeah. Hi. Um, okay, so you talked about some of the courses that are completely online based, but you didn't really talk about um, Minerva, which is, I don't know if people know what it is, but it's trying to be um, a complete higher ed experience based yeah. entirely on online learning. And um, just quick thing, I'm going to be a senior undergrad and I wanted to take the rest of my time at school off because I think school is slow and I think you can learn a lot faster. Just based on using online courses and direct things, but I, I felt uncomfortable quitting so far in, and so I was just wondering if you think it's going to be a complete learning experience or if it's just gonna be something that kind of adds to the current whatever is going on in your life. Um, well, I think there's, there are people who are gonna use these tools to go from, some, from nothing to something, and there are people that are gonna use these tools to go from good to great. And you know, there is no complete learning experience. Right? We're constantly always learning and it's always incomplete and it's, you know, it's continuous. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of like my capsule answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, there's someone up, up here. Did you? Yeah. And then, yeah. Um, you talked a lot about uh, sort of higher ed online learning, and I think a lot of it is pitched at sort of adults and people who haven't had college education or want to add to that. But... Uh, can you talk a little bit about what's being done online for children and sort of uh, primary uh, levels of learning? Sure. So the, the world of innovation in K-12 is ruled by the 56,000 American school districts and the federal standards and state standards. So within the world of school, it's very difficult to kind of get this stuff 
in use, although it's not, you know, it's not completely out of the question. But the, where, the place where the ferment is happening and the excitement is out of school learning, after school learning, enrichment learning, um, camps and, and libraries and museums and sort of the idea of, you know, everything that the kids do. And the, the really awesome opportunity there is right according to the Pew uh, research that uh, K-12 age kids are consuming uh, 11 and a half hours of media a day during eight and a half hours of screen time. So they, they count it twice because they got two screens up at the same time. Um, so they're already spending more time with digital media than they are spending in school. Um, and so the question is, is there any way to kind of, what do we do? Do we add vitamins to that digital media and make it nutritious learning-wise and try to improve its learning? Or do we try to maybe honor what the learning that they are doing and the work that they're already doing in gaming and what is gaming teaching them? Can we design better games? AT&T just made a huge investment um, in a, a company called Game Desk, which is a nonprofit startup out of USC that's doing, I think, some of the coolest uh, g learning game design. The crazy part about how to do learning game design is that you need to get in a room a brilliant content expert and a great designer, a visual artist, and they all need to be on the same page and they all need to understand exactly what it is they're designing. So wait, this is an aerodynamics game? Well, what does the aerodynamics look like? And what does the bird look like when it's in the air? And how do we show the forces? And is this correct? And is it fun to play? It's very difficult. Um, but, you know, so the, but I think there's a lot of cool stuff happening. And I think the other world where this is kind of strange and, and, and weird is uh, with uh, online test prep, because tests are becoming more and more important in K-12 online assessment. And then just plain all, you know, online public charter schools. Right, so there are, you know, there's online, there's an open high school in Florida, there's one in Utah. Um, there's more kids every day taking high school courses, uh, either because they're GED completers or, uh, or they're homeschooled and they wanna get a few courses here and there. So that's kind of growing under the radar. Or it's a very poor school, uh, school district and they wanna get an AP course and they don't have the money for it so they're doing it remotely. Um, so all of that stuff is happening. Um, you in the back and then you in the front, yeah. Sorry. You got notes. This is a little, I'm nervous. Don't worry, I didn't write down my question. Um, so I'm coming out of a PhD program in the humanities and my first teaching assignment in the fall um, is a permanent job where I am being expected to teach online only. Um, this is um, at, at a limit of 45 students for, two, for a, a sort of upper level undergrad course. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the disconnect between the kind of education that's practiced in rooms and campuses like this and the places where there is demand for those faculty to teach, um, both in terms of preparation and in terms of the kinds of students people are being taught to teach. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> students who sit in rooms like this generally already have had the filters applied, um, and it's a very different thing teaching them than it is so it's my understanding that academics were never taught how to teach. That's also true. <laughs> They've never been rewarded for teaching well either. Right. Not directly, right? And they hardly ever get to teach students that are as good as the students that were in class with them. Right. Because they were the ones who stuck with it all the way through the end. And the students that you are going to have are the ones that haven't stuck with it all the way through the end yet. And they, you know, they made it to the school that they're at. So um, this has been a problem for, or not a problem, but this has been a situation that people like you have been in for a really long mm -hmm. time. Um, and it seems really different now, I guess, because of the online dimension to it. Um, and uh, the only, the good thing about it, I think, is that everybody is learning how to do this stuff and everyone is new to it. And I'll tell you, the most robust online learning communities are the communities about online learning. Right. <laughs> if you are interested in, you know, ed tech and mm -hmm. learning yeah, how to yeah. teach using technology, they are hella wikis and blog right. lists and Twitter f feeds and ed tech chat. And everything you need, you can get up to speed very quickly if you plunge in. I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about the political economy that's making this a this kind of learning okay. a necessity for large state institutions where there aren't seats in, in classrooms well, enough to hold the students. Say more about that. What's the concern? Um, the political economy is of online learning is, well, we'll expect a student to buy a computer and we will expect that they can carve out some, some place in their single parent home, some space and time to do this coursework. Yeah. Um, I thought the, the model you're describing about using campuses as existing, as centers to keep students' motivation up is great, but my students are um, taking online courses in between their two jobs and their child rearing. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's why, that's why the current model is unsustainable, right? I mean, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think that is sustainable, and I don't think that is you know, socially beneficial. I think we need to have, but in order to stop doing that, we need to have a really big redeployment of existing resources as well as new investment. Um, and that's going to take a lot of different kind of movement. Um. I wanted to ask you to say more about deploying the human resources. Um, it seems to me that building it and assuming they will come is really not a solution because those who come, as you already said, are the ones who are motivated, who have time, who have access to computers and reliable sources of electricity that doesn't go on and off in brownouts all the time, yep. and who know that this is going to serve them, that putting in a lot of effort in the short term, all by themselves perhaps, or only with some peers, is going to serve them really well in the long term. And the people I'm worried about are the people who don't know that and who have no way of knowing it unless they sort of wander into some kind of institution um, nominally of higher learning where somebody might get hold of them and help them find out what there is to gain. Um, this is, universities can sometimes do this. Co high schools sometimes can do this. But in a highly atomized system where everybody is supposed to log on and take care of themselves, um, the opportunity to find out what you don't know and need to know, it's not clear to me where that's going to come from. The way that the university has conceived of its role is as this beacon of knowledge, right, for a long time. Um, before the university, people achieved their learning goals in a different way. Um, and I really am interested in, uh, I, I talk a lot about, I use the metaphor of the community of practice, which is an, an anthropological um, study in the early 90s where people, they kind of looked in this question of, how did people learn before they had formal schooling? Was everybody just totally ignorant? Or did they learn things? Did they know how to do stuff? Um, and they looked at people, they looked at groups of uh, midwives in the Yucatan, uh, tailors in West Africa, um, and uh, actually addicts in recovery. And they, they said, you know, what you have, what you need is you have a group of people uh, taking part in a task with a common understanding of the goal or the outcome. Um, then you have people who come in and watch from the outside um, and this is called legitimate peripheral participation. They're giving little tasks to do, like if you are, if your aunt is a midwife and you're five years old and you're following her through the, through the forest and you have to sort the twigs and the leaves and then she starts telling you a little bit about what's what. And then you, once you've learned a little bit of something, you're constantly do, you're taking part in the work of the group. You learn a little bit of something and then you teach someone else right away. Um, you know, which is not to say, like, so, so people learned how to do stuff communally in those groups if they manage to find a group like that. Um, there isn't always necessarily needed to be a centralized beacon of knowledge in order for people to realize that they didn't know stuff and that they needed to know stuff. But, you know, in a very complex knowledge-based society, you know, it, it, we're, we're going to be waiting a long time if we, you know, and people are going to get very far apart very quickly if we kind of wait for everybody to sit in the grass and like figure this out for themselves. Um, so yeah, there is, I mean, to me, that is just an argument for any institution that wants to be a beacon of knowledge to start to figure out how to get open, as open as possible and as visible as possible and as public as possible about what they're doing and why it's important. And also to accept the fact that you maybe not be, you know, you, you maybe not have the power that you used to have to dictate what you think people need to know. The people might have more choice and more ability to choose what they think they need to know and then you might have to come to them and serve them. which worries me a lot because I see so many kids there who have only local connections, only local knowledge, and with the, the best will in the world and complete amiability, 
have no clue that they might need to learn more than their immediate communities give them. So how do you think they're going to find that out? I'm not, I think a lot of them are not until they get, and they're going to hit a really nasty economic crunch when they find themselves unprepared for any work that's available for them or a world in which there isn't any work available for them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question to, in your beginning uh, introduction there about the, the economics of the, co the colleges and that it's because of the cost of the human thing, I think that's kind of a little bit off because there's way too much, the colleges have invested so much right now into infrastructure of their buildings and they also take and play their grants and I was told once that, um, I was wondering why if you were a business school why couldn't you take the, pra I know this is alarming, but why couldn't you take the practices of good business um, practice and take and show how you can run a business efficiently, you know, et cetera? And I was told you can't because in education, if you're Harvard or the other school or whatever, you all have to be at the certain price level to compete, so there's a panache in, in having that. So therefore, the only way that they lower their bottom line is that they give you more in scholarships, or they discount their prices. But the uh, MR, you know, the manufacturer's just yes. sort of price is fifty thousand dollars, and then so there's efficiencies and things like that you're just not going to see. And it do, I don't, I wouldn't put it all on to the fact that you have the human factor. So, okay, so this is a chapter in my book, right? I looked very detailed into this. Um, the the uh, cost, the Delta Cost Project, uh, Jane Wellman uh, does the most detailed research on this, um, finds that you're right in the sense that, first of all, across the board, um, universities, about 70% of their budget is payroll and compensation in general. Healthcare, obviously, uh, is important here. Pensions, because a lot of these are public employees. Right. Not faculty. The amount of money spent on teaching is going down because of the casualization of academic labor and uh, adjuncts. Where it's puffing up is in the administrative offices and in services and staff, right, for these buildings. So uh, the public, so, the, so that's, a very, that's an underlying kind of thing. And I think, you know, so the, the cost disease is correct in the sense that it is mostly paying people, um, not necessarily teachers. In the public realm, the cost thing happens because uh, state funding gets cut and the cost gets shifted onto students in the form of tuition, ultimately onto loans. In the private realm, there is something called, you know, like a perks war where they're marketing and competing not on um, the quality of what they do, because remember, all the work is done in the admissions office, but they're marketing and competing on the quality of uh, how they look and we know the, the offerings that they have and how it compares to other people's offerings. And sometimes on the price itself, which is kind of totally perverse and bizarre. Um, so an interesting factor that's you know entering in here is when you have these, I mean, two out of these three that I'm talking about are for-profit startups, they're venture-funded startups. And the word, you know, that the name of for-profit has had, you know, not a great run in education. Um, but these are a little bit different because they're in partnership with existing universities. They have a lot of prestige going for them and they, they say that they're going to offer their stuff for free. Well, not for profit and for profit. All it is is a tax classification. It has nothing to do with functionality, how well it's run, and what their mission is. And so that's totally a misnomer. You can get paid $400,000 or $800,000 if you're a United Way president. Yep. doesn't mean that. <laughs> but you're accountable in a very different way than you are if you're a publicly traded company well, that's, with shareholders that's that want to see right, but an increase from quarter to quarter. In, I mean, the for-profit universities right now, the University of Phoenix is, they, it's not an accident that they keep having problems with fraud and uh, and misjudgment because they are run to recruit students and to get their their first payment of federal student loans and they don't really care what happens to them afterwards. Um, but that's a whole other yeah. conversation. Yeah, there and then there and there. I actually had two questions which we may not have time for, so you can pick one if you like. Um, I was curious if there had been any um, what you would deem successful experiments in the realm of music education, because I'm coming from Berkeley College of Music today. Um, and the other um, is that uh, I'm actually slightly excited that I'm hearing what I am from you today, having just a month ago at um, Association of College and Research Libraries heard kind of um, higher ed bubble stuff and 
this idea that librarians had no place. And when you started talking about communities and the need for that, um, I went, ooh, that's, that's libraries. Um, so I was just wondering on a, on a more global scale, maybe slightly detached from the higher ed institutions, if you think that would be a sustainable way forward too. Because I feel like here, for the, for the um, digital gap, the, the public library system has been huge in helping kind of step that up. So, um, and I know there have been a few experimental steps in that direction in Rwanda and a few other places, but yeah. anyway, pick a question. I, oh, I, mean, I mean, I don't know much about music education and I love talking about libraries because librarians always get really excited when I talk about this stuff because the, the role of the teacher is changing and a lot of what, uh, when teachers are no longer the repositories of knowledge, but they're the people that guide you to knowledge and help you make sense of the knowledge that's out there or the classification and help you define what your question is, this is all stuff that librarians are very good at. They're good at information science. They're good at you know how to find things and also how to you know again like how to help to help you define your question. Um, so this is a great paradigm for teaching, I think, in the in the sort of information commodified world. And libraries are a great physical resource that exists that fills in the gap from birth all the way through retirement. Right? All this all the learning that people need to do when they're not physically enrolled in a school or during the hours they're not in school, um, a library is a great place for that if you have the funding to do it. Um, and I think, you know, it's really interesting because we're living in this age of austerity, right? And so many public resources are being cut back to the bone. But it's precisely when you have a little bit of excess and a little bit of, of sort of unpurposed stuff lying around that you get to innovate because you get to have the, the space and the time to kind of do that. So the fact that we're having to innovate and do it with less at the same time, I think, is really, you know, scary. And people kind of get into a defensive crouch when they talk about, you know, we're going to, but it's so short sighted, right, to say, this is a bubble and therefore we need to do everything but, you know, we need to cut everything but the essentials. And the essentials is something that we defined, you know, 30 years ago when we did our assessment of what, was, what were our basic needs. Um, we need to take some of our resources now and do another assessment of what's essential and then work from that. Um, and so how many more questions do I have time for? Okay. So, yes, hi. How are you doing? Good, um, how are you? Uh, I'll just, yeah. Uh, I really appreciate that your presentation comes from the point of view of what students want and what students need. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about learner satisfaction and uh, when students are happiest with their learning experience in the open ed world, do they feel like their learning style was accommodated and w in what way? Oh, great question. Um, when students are jazzed, first of all, they really like having choices um, and being able to follow exactly what it is that they are interested in. Um, but also at the same time being guided and feeling like there is um, a person there. I was really surprised to hear people say stuff like, Andrew Ng is the best teacher I've ever had, even though I never met him. Um, and it's very intimate feeling like watching a, someone, you know, a video of that person in their office talking to you and then answering your questions. Um, so that's exciting to people. People really like having feedback. You know, everybody likes a little bit of a ding feeling. Uh, how did you do? Did you get that right or not? Just very simple, just immediately, right away. Um, and then, you know, how are you doing? Maybe how's your progress compared to other people in the class? Although not even that. I mean, the feedback tools are not that complicated right now. Just, it's basically just like, how did you do in the homework? Did you get it right in, immediately, right away? How did you do in the homework? Then the feedback of, if I post a question in the forum, somebody answers me right away. Or they say, hey, I had that question too. Look over here. Um, so there's a little bit of social give and take. And there is a... Uh, there's a cohort feeling because people are going through the class at the same time. And then there's like some socializing that goes on around that. Like, oh, you're from Qatar, I'm from Qatar too. Let's have a, you know, let's have a talk in our time zone type of thing. So easy social tools for connecting. Um, but, you know, there's different, the Open University in UK had someone I interviewed who did some PhD research on this and they said, there's different categories of people. There's like very serious learner people who are just geeks about learning, and there's people who are very social and just want to like kind of post and talk to people. Um, and then there's people who are sort of uh, just very lightly just browsing through, engaging with things, and they don't necessarily have a, a particular goal in mind. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it runs right into this question of, well, what if they don't want what we want them to want? Or what if they don't want anything and we want to keep giving them stuff? Um, and how to, you know, we've been, the education pipeline has been so used to sort of having captive audience for so long, it's really hard to think about how to serve people. Um, and it's not to say that you, I mean, you need to solve that problem, right? Because people kind of 
you, you, we do kind of think that everybody needs some version of this stuff. They need to learn. But I, I mean, I also go back to the thing of like, people always learn. You know, given basic other, you know, lower on the hierarchy of needs are satisfied, people will learn. So, and there's maybe one more. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, and then you guys can ask. Or, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just had a question about accreditation, and particularly with not necessarily the schools themselves online, but the students and what they get afterwards. I think there's been some mentions in the press about plenty of schools that you know people are paying lots of money for, and then they get their diploma, they get their degree, and they're not only, I mean, it's great that they're, potentially more educated, but not only do they not have a job, but now they're out thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important component that I'm curious about as we move toward a more open, open democratic educational process, which I think is great, but what is the benefit to the students at the end of the day, especially the disenfranchised, the ones who are busy, strapped, no money, you know, don't have the support system in place? So there's a number of different ways to kind of get at this problem. Obviously, the, you know, you have to go from the baseline of saying the current system doesn't work very well. People buy an answers to tests. People buy term papers. People, you know, get sucked into non-accredited or barely accredited programs that they, you know, and, and they're are, they're preyed upon. The less they know about education, the less educated consumers they are, the more likely they are to be on the other end of the phone with a telemarketer who's kind of trying to sell them a, a bill of goods. So the system we have now is not working so well. What could work better? Uh, in the online realm, um, you obviously have this problem that you don't necessarily know who's showing up, um, and you have to, you know, think about different ways. Uh, Western Governors University, which is a very kind of um, forward-looking online um, nonprofit, private, uh, has just instituted a thing. They used to have physical proctored exams, so wherever you were, you go to a place and take a test in front of a person. And now they have a webcam version of that where the proctor is sitting somewhere else and you have to take your webcam and like, or take your laptop and like show the room that there's no one else in the room <laughs> while you're <laughs> taking the test. Um, and there's different kinds of assessment that can work. So Tutor is a very um, expensive uh, online program that's used by Georgetown, used by USC to train teachers, which is interesting, and also social workers. Um, and nurses. And so all of these, uh, the classes are face-to-face, -face, video, synchronous, and then there's practicums. And in the practicums, you have to film yourself in the classroom talking to the students. And so instead of uh, the observer comes in for five minutes in the back of the room while I'm teaching, and I, like, I prepared really well for that day, they, you're videoed every week, and you have to show you know, to your, your fellow students and to the teacher how to do it. So different kinds of assessment. This peer grading stuff is really fascinating. Coursera is trying to have a poetry class and a history class, and they're trying to have peers read the papers and grade the papers according to a rubric and according to, and they match that grade to you know, the sampling that is done by the instructor, and so they, they sort of, and then five people look at your paper and then, you know, or your poem and decide, like, is it good enough? So um, that's really interesting. I think that the making people responsible to each other is a very interesting way of sort of working on academic integrity and honor and reinvigorating the idea of an academic community. Um, you know, if, if you really, and I think anybody who's worked on a group presentation or a project has encountered this situation where you know someone's not pulling their weight. Do you tell them? Do you not tell them? Um, and something that you up in front of the room is a bigger deal than something you just turn into the professor. So in the world of openness, you have an opportunity to do stuff that actually makes people work harder and has more uh, juice to it, more you know content to it. It's not just a multiple choice um, kind of throwaway thing. Um, but you have to use, I think, lots of these different tools together to try to optimize. Yeah. So, uh, oh. I think we're about out of time, but you'll, be, you'll stick around for a few more questions. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you so much, Anya. Thank, Thank you. you.